I have the honor of introducing our two speakers today. Um, first, we have Susan Pease Gadwa. Is that Gadwa? She's a marriage and family. Wait, she's a LCSW. Is a marriage and family ex very marriage and divorce expert. As a child of divorced parents, Susan knows firsthand how disruptive an unhappy marriage and subsequent marital dissolution can be. When her mother and father split in 1981 on their 28th anniversary, marriage counseling was unheard of and emotional divorce support virtually non-existent. Her own experience combined with years of working with couples in distress, both in striving to save their marriage or transition out of it, led Susan to become passionate about offering support to save pe support to people at perhaps one of the most crucial junctures of their lives. Susan is the author of two books on divorce, San Francisco Chronicle bestseller, Contemplating Divorce, Stronger Day by Day, and co-author of the recently released The New I Do, Reshaping Marriage for Skeptics, Realists, and Rebels, written with, co with journalist Vicki Larson. She has been on TV and radio worldwide, including CBS's The Early Show, Canada's The Social, and Australia's The Daily Edition. In addition to her therapy skills, Susan is a trained mediator and collaborative divorce coach. With over 20 years in private practice in Marin County, Susan recently opened a Santa Rosa office after moving to Sonoma County in 2012. Vicki Larson is an award-winning journalist and co-author of The New I Do, Reshaping Marriage for Skeptics, Realists, and Rebels. Her, the lifestyle editor and writer at San Francisco Bay Area newspaper, she has also been featured blogger for the Huffington Post, columnist for Mommy Tract, managing the chaos of modern motherhood, modernmom.com, and Divorce 360, and contributor to the anthologies Nothing But the Truth, So Help Me God, 73 Women on Life's Transitions, and Knowing Pains, Women on Love, Sex, and Work in Our 40s. She's been on TV in the States and abroad, including The Better Show, Canada's The Social, and The Morning Show, Australia's The Daily Edition, and on National Public Radio in the San Francisco Bay Area and Minnesota. A twice-divorced mother of two young men, she blogs about marriage, divorce, and parenting at OMG Chronicles and is on Twitter. So with that, I introduce our two wonderful speakers. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Is this too loud? No. Okay, well thank you. What a lovely welcome. Um, I don't know if people are interested, but Vicki um, works at the, no, I, I'm gonna totally rephrase this. Um, Vicki, I was gonna tell you the history of how Vicki and I got, got connected on this project. Vicki works at the Marin IJ, and um, she and I both were blogging for Huffington Post. And um, we both kept coming across each other, and so we connected and said, do you wanna work on a project together? And um, this, the, this book, The New I Do, is based on um, my belief that I developed about 10 years, 12 years ago, that marriage as we practice it is a very shame-based institution, meaning if you don't fit into this one mold, you're doing something wrong. So part of that was based on my personal experience. I didn't get married until I was 43, and people kept saying, what's wrong with you? How come you're not married? Um, and then it was also based on my work with the divorcing population who would come in and tell me that they felt like they were failing because they had a failed marriage, and I hate that term. So um, it just, the seeds were planted years ago on something needs to change in how we view and do marriage. And so that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. Do you wanna add 
I'll just add that because I've been married and divorced twice, I have a little bit of a different experience than Susan, who married later. Um, obviously, I don't know what commitment is or something wrong with me. I had two failed marriages, although the first <laughs> one happened when I was young and there were no children, so therefore it didn't matter. The second one, when I had two children, of course, mattered, and everyone was wringing their hands about it. So I come from that feeling of being shamed because I couldn't make my marriages last. So um, I was delighted when Susan asked me to join her, and um, it's been a wild ride. Yes, it has. Yes. So um, in any case, I'm going to have to stand over here because I've got a mouse that I need to put on the podium. So. Um, <clears throat> Pardon? Yeah. Oh, well, I guess we can move it a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. It's it's actually fine, Chris. Thank you. Um, so anyway, um, so what we're going to be talking about today is 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 marriage as we know it dying, and um, the short answer is yes. I'll. I'll be a, a spoiler. Um, the first thing that I would like to do with everyone um, is I'm going to be handing out a piece of paper that has some questions on it. And I really would like you to be very quick. I'll give that to you if you can. Um, Vicki's got some on that side of the room. If anyone needs a pencil, this is something that I do not want you to spend very much time on thinking about. Um, I would really love to get your immediate responses to this. Uh, the marriages I see in my therapy practice. No, whatever you want to, whatever, whatever comes up for you, we're just interested in, in knowing that. And again, I really don't want you spending a lot of time and thought power on it. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Oh, that's right. Okay, I'm going to give one minute, so... I hope that's a good sign. <laughs> you laughed her. <laughs> Pick on you first, Hal. No, we got more. Here, give me that. Okay. So um, it, it's okay if you're not done, because we're going to have some discussion about this. But um, can a brave person? Uh, say what they put down for defined marriage? Yes. A legal contract based upon the illusion of a static emotional commitment. <laughs> <laughs> I would love, can I have that quote? We would Bingo. love to use that. Did everyone hear that? Can I, can I read it up at the front of the room? I love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. A legal contract based upon the illusion of a state, static emotion, uh, sorry, a static emotional commitment. So I love it. Thank you. Um, the ideal life path. Anybody not know what to fill in? Oh, OK. Graduate. So you go to high school, graduate from college, get a job, get married, buy a house, and start having children. Anyone not get that script? And there probably are some people in the room who didn't, but most of us got the script, yes. I got the script, but I refuse to write it. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. And that's our point, too. That's our point. We have been programmed, and we're saying, stop it. You know, and I'm trying to think, should you get me started now, or should I wait? Um, define a typical family. Anybody have a, anything you could put in there? You did. Uh, a group of people who love each other and enjoy shared traditions. Nice. Okay. The, yeah, so 
th that is a common core in terms of, you know, the compilation of people and all that other, that's what is changing. There is no typical anymore, right? Um, and that's part of why I said describe your neighbors, you know, um, we're diverse everywhere. I mean, there's diversity in every neighborhood now where that, or I shouldn't say every, but you know, more neighborhoods now than ever before, um, which is a good thing. Um, and what do you notice about how you were taught, you know, what it all should look like versus how it really is? Anybody want to comment? And how you were chuckling, do you want to? I hadn't gotten that far. Though. Oh, okay. What were you chuckling about? Oh, uh, the ideal path. Uh-huh, okay, yeah. <laughs> light bulb went on about the programming, right? Anyway, anybody want to comment about the difference between um, what you know the we're taught and and what it really is like out there? Yes. Well, I was taught the lifetime you had to subscribe here, but I would model divorce with all of that. Okay. And then in reality, it's a whole other story. Right. Okay. So divorce is more mainstream now. Chris. Uh, it's interesting to me when I, I think, when I question what, whether that was ever true, you know, I think ever been is what everybody does. You know, there have always been different times. Thus, you know, the illusion of the, you know, yeah, it, it I think that uh, it's sort of Oz-ish in that sense, that it's not really, you know, behind closed doors, and as therapists, we know the stories of what goes on behind closed doors. So, yeah, and we've, we've been holding on to this ideal and this model, and A, it doesn't really exist, and the bar is so high to reach that very few people can really truly attain it. And then we make everyone wrong who doesn't do it, right? And that's, that's what we're talking about today. So any other comments on this exercise? Yes, John. Uh, how are they different? And I wrote, ah, yes. often people are acting out their childhood socialization from their parents. So just expand on that. Well, they, one of the questions I asked in my history is how did your parents relate to each other? And I know this over and over and over again that the client today is relating to his or her partner just exactly the way the parents did. Exactly. So they fight, they divorce, there's alcoholism, there's unhappy. Yeah, it, it, you tend to play out. Yeah. And, and I <clears throat> say, so you either play out the same thing or you do 180 degrees from something, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, which is often the same thing. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Sorry about doing that in your ears. Um, so yeah, so that's, our, that's what's modeled and that's what we think is normal. So um, anyway, I do have, um, these aren't the best props, so bear with me, yes. I, I just want to share a reflection. Yes. Leslie has been in a relationship for 38 years. <coughs> My relationship to marriage is very different than probably to other than me. Mm -hmm. that marriage is something that's been denied me. Right. And I have a lot of feelings about that. Right. And how my culture has demonized me. Absolutely. I'm pathologist, me, I'm okay right this time. <laughs> so there is something about marriage for those of us who have been told we can't get married that I think is very different than I agree. probably what you're presenting. Well, I don't know if we incorporate that. Yeah. We actually yes. do, yes. And, and, and we do because that was really important. And from all of the research that we did of um, same-sex couples, mm -hmm. whether married or not, they do do it differently. And actually, some researchers have wondered that if more and more same-sex couples marry, whether they will continue to be more egalitarian or will they will fall into the old patterns that we are trying to get out of. Yeah. And we don't know yet. We don't know yet. And there's also the element of definition of family. Yes. Since we have been denied a legal and social definition of family, we have created our own family. And the right. complexity and ingenuity and creativity of these families is just so heartwarming because a normal definition of family that would not fit. But these are families in essence and in reality. And so I just want to say that. We actually celebrate that in the book. 
Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and I do think we're going to cover some of that today. Yeah. Um, so, yes. So, um, back to the props. <clears throat> These are my one size fits all. Um, this is a shirt I got in New York years ago. And you can see that <clears throat> it's my night shirt, but um, we, we all look pretty different in this shirt, correct? Right? And so that's our point about, you know, we have this one structure. It's a one size fits all structure. And it fits better on some than others. But then we have, this is my favorite, this shirt. Has anyone ever seen this kind of shirt before? And so um, Vicki is going to model, this is what we're suggesting <laughs> happen with marriage. So this is basically, it, right <laughs> it's a one size fits all, but it expands and it contours and it looks fabulous, doesn't it? So, <laughs> so basically what we are, are suggesting is that what we need to do as, uh, thank you Vicki, Mer Carol Merrill, <laughs> as, a, um, as a society, as a culture is, is go with something that has some elasticity, something that can fit more the needs of more of the people. Right? So that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So we have a quiz. We have some from game you know, show type things here, quizzes. Um, the first question, today more than half of children born to women under the age of 30 are born to women who aren't married. Anybody true? How many think that's true? More than half of the children born to women in the U.S. In the US are born to, okay. So how many think that's false? Okay. That one's true. So, and I think I have a stat on the difference between today and 1960. It's, it's really changing. And that's, that's one thing that I think all of you are sitting here because you realize that marriage is changing in ways, in fact, there's an extra slide in here that wasn't here a week ago because we've seen a change in uh, Florida upholding uh, same-sex marriage. And that just happened this past week. So um, it's really exciting times and um, I think it's really great that all the therapists are sitting here because I think we need to really understand how to support our clients who are going into this institution or avoiding it because of the rigid structure and, and how can we help people get what they need out of pair, uh, pairing up. Okay, so the next, there's been a 300% increase in single motherhood, that's the stat, since 1960. How many think that's true? <laughs> How many think it's false? Yeah, Laura's right. It's 600%. 600, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And some of those, do you want to talk about the single by choice? Um, yeah, there, some of those are single mothers by choice, but um, change glasses. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Get to a certain age and need to do glasses. Um, uh, actually, the percentage of single mothers by choice, is people know what, I mean, I'm assuming you, you know what that is. It's just uh, women who are choosing to have children on their own or got pregnant accidentally and then decided to just raise the child without a partner. So um, in the United States in 2011, 19% of births in the 35 to 39 um, age group are to single women. That's 89,854 births and 21.4% in the over 40 age group. And that's 24,000. 333, and that comes from um, uh, an organization called um, choicemoms.org. Okay. So that's a small percentage, actually. Yeah, but still, it is, but still, it is something in right. there. Okay, so um, anyway, 87% of the world's population lives in countries with marriage rates that have fallen since the 1980s. How many think that's true? 87%. Okay, false? All right, you think it's too high? Think again, it's true. It's, it is happening all over the world that marriage is becoming less appealing, 
um, people are choosing it less. And so again, that's important for us to know about. Yes. Oh, I was going to mention, thank you. Um, there's a, the last slide has some of the references. And so, and it shows you which slide they go to. So you can look up some of this yourself. Okay? Yes, on the last slide. Um, and, and I will say, um, I, I'm, I have a handout, um, a sign in. If anybody would like to um, be kept up to date on uh, the marital trends or what Vicki and I are up to, I have a um, piece of paper that you can put your email address. Um, you can let me know. I actually will be offering a free 30 minute consultation, case consultation, if you feel like you have a case that you want to run by me and get some extra support on. So there's that and um, a bit of a newsletter. So if people are interested, please do uh, sign up for that. And then also, if you would like a copy, since I didn't provide handouts, if you would like, <clears throat> I'm kind of a tree hugger, uh, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, I will email it to you. So make sure you your email's legible on there. Um, okay, so next, I have another quiz. Test your marriage IQ. Out of the four following statements, which one is false? The Romans had three levels of marriage. Middle East cultures used to practice a temporary short-term marriage so young people could have sex without being penalized or ostracized. For most of history, love had no place in marriage. And finally, marriage among gay men has been practiced for centuries in parts of West Africa. Who wants to take a guess? Is there one that's obviously true up there? Which one? Right, we know, we know that one. Who else wants to guess at what the false statement is? Middle East cultures having a short, that is true. That is true. Nope, that one's true. So it only leaves. So here's the thing: the the marriage among gay men has been practiced. Um, what th that is not the practice. It is a practice where women, and I don't believe they're lesbian women doing this. I I don't know, but um, take a what's called a female husband, and the reason for that is that they can. Um, still be a mom to children if they can't have children or they won't lose their in-laws if they've lost their spouse. And I, I think it's kind of rare, but um, anyway, so I, I thought that was interesting. And one of the things that Vicki and I do in The New I Do is we show you that throughout history and throughout um, our culture, around, cultures around the world, People marry in a lot of different ways. I mean, one of the funniest ones that we came across was that if a woman cooked for a man, she was married to him. And uh, likewise, if she stopped cooking, they were divorced. And that's really, and that's true, you know. How much easier that would be. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And that, that actually is, you know, gets to the point, I've done a lot of work with divorce, and Doug and I have um, done some work together with our divorcing populations. And um, divorce wasn't always a big ordeal like this. It used to be you could write your spouse a letter, you know, the, the I think it's the Irish, jump backward over the broomstick. I mean, that would have been a lot easier. Yes. Um, there was one that was based on politics, one that was based on religion, and there was a third one that sort of happened by default, somewhat like the common law um, marriage, where if you lived together for more than a year, you were married. Yeah, okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. So, has marriage become too old-fashioned for today's youth? Again, I think the short answer is yes. In 1960, 10%, one in 10 of those age 25 were unmarried. In 2012, 20% of all 25-year-olds were unmarried. So that's doubled. 69% um, of millennials believe that society should have other priorities besides marriage, such as advanced education and establishing a career. This poor kids, they don't know what to do because the advanced education, they come out with all the student loan. I mean, it's, it's harder out there, I think. So anyway, they're not seeing marriage as a priority. Yes? It's called having a friend with benefits. 
Oh, exactly, hooking up, friend with benefits, yes. Okay, um, recent urban institute study suggests that more than 30% of young people will still be single at age 40. And again, that's more than double of just the Gen Xers. We're, this is happening faster. Do you yeah, wanna actually, add? I wanna add a little yeah. bit more on that. Um, According to the Urban Institute, if marriage rates remain at recession or post-recession levels, the number of millennials who will marry by age 40 could decrease as much as 12 percentage points below the level among 40-year-olds today. But in an alternative scenario, even if marriage rates bounce back substantially, the percentage of millennials marrying by age 40 will still decrease below the level for any previous generation of Americans. Furthermore, under both scenarios, there will be a continuing divergence in marriage patterns by education and race, increasing the social and economic divide between the still mostly married haves and the increasingly single have-nots. And if the rates continue the way they are now, according to Stephanie Kuntz, um, no women will be marrying by 2043. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's so what's boring. happening. Yes, exactly. Okay. Oops. Oh no. How did I not? Yeah. Okay, you guys are. Oh, you know what? My. <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll say one thing. According to the Pew um, studies, the 18 to 29 year olds, 70 percent said that they do want to marry eventually, and 74 percent that they want to say that they want to have children. So um, bless you. Um, so <laughs> it's. It's still what a lot of us young people expect is going to happen in their life at some point. They're spending more time, I'm sure you've heard of the term emerging adulthood. Um, this is um, what Jeffrey Arnett coined, and there's people 18 to 29 postponing marriage and parenthood so that, and self-focused exploration as they try out different possibilities in love and work. And a lot of them want to get education, especially women, and get higher degrees now that women can do that. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so... Um, Final one on here. Factors believed responsible for the current trend are the lower, uh, in the lower marriage rates, the Great Recession, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, as Vicki just talked about, the growing income gap between the haves and have not shifting attitudes. You know, there's not the same social pressure that there was even 20 years ago to get married or have a particular life path. Um, contraceptives have made it so that people don't have to worry so much about having a child when they don't want one. Um, and then working women um, have really been a game changer in, um, in what, how millennials view um, what's next for them in adulthood. So um, I wanted to share with you, and I'm sure you all have similar stories, but there was a point, so I work a lot with divorcing women. I run uh, groups uh, for divorcing women and have done some educational programs. And at one point in 2007, I, I looked at all my <laughs> population, went 18% of my population was homeless. And, I, and one was an attorney, one was a social worker, one was a, an accountant. Um, these were not, you know, low functioning people. They were really high functioning. And they still, you know, I'm, I know we all saw a lot of havoc. Um, so people had to get creative with their lifestyles. Pe couples would come in to see me and they'd say, we can't afford to move out. Can you help us figure out a way that we can live in the same space? And, and have you know, some agreements in place. And that was actually the beginning of what we call the parenting marriage, um, where I really have helped uh, quite a few couples now transition from the romantic model of marriage that wasn't working for them into you know, those people that want to divorce but they don't want to leave because of the children. So this is actually a way, and I'll talk more when we get to that slide, that we can transition people into staying in a situation that's not toxic because these people realize that they're better friends than lovers and, you know, so we'll, we'll get into that more. But um, it was just a time when, you know, people had to 
uh, get creative. We saw obviously the decline in the quality of marriage. So the divorce rate went down, but it didn't mean that people were more happily married, as we all know. So there were more incidents of domestic violence as one measure. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that unhappily married people had to stay together because they couldn't afford to divorce. Um, unmarried needed to cohabit. Uh, even young people these days need to live with other people. Um, and so I think that's one reason why we're seeing the numbers of cohabitation in romantic couples increase. Um, it's just an affordability piece. And then, um, I did want to put something in that I found as well for the, you know, in defense of healthy marriages, that the recession often made people say, okay, um, we want to recommit to making this marriage work. And so that happened as well. Just jump in if you want to add anything here. Um, this is just a slide showing the Pew Research. Um, the Pew Urban Institute, some of these places are really tracking these numbers, um, and it's very helpful. But you'll see that the peak of the marriage rate was in 1960, and it's gone down since then. Again, just watching the trends. Okay, and meanwhile, as, as some hetero couples are rejecting and delaying the traditional paradigm, and I say traditional because, again, this is a very new, modern version of marriage that we keep calling traditional. So just want to remind people of that. Um, Same-sex couples are fighting for the right to marry. So this was the slide that I had a week ago, and I don't know how well you can see the states where there, there, there's some activity and the laws are probably going to change. But um, since that slide, um, I just added this one where Florida is now so we have 36 states that are upholding the right. And I feel like it's just one of these issues that we're going to look back and say, how could we ever think that it was OK to not allow same-sex marriage? Yes. I just want to reflect on a previous slide. It seems like most people are married, but most marriages end. And so, even, so most people that are married are obviously in second, third marriages. So right. Still, even though it's you know half, most people want to have something of the value that they perceive in marriage. That, that's true. As a matter of fact, a, a recent um, statistics were four out of every ten marriages, it, newlyweds, have been married before. At least one. Twenty percent of one has been married before. T Twenty percent both have been married before. Yeah, so we are multiple marriers. So this idea that. It's until death do us part is not really true for many, many people. And, um, and we should just name that and stop right. making longevity be the only marker of a quote unquote successful marriage. And getting to the um, to same sex couples, I wanted to throw some numbers out here. As of 2011, there were about 605,000 households that were occupied by same sex couples and almost 169,000 of them were married. 16% had at least one child, whether biologically step or adopted. So if people are talking about marriages for children, well, here you've got some same-sex couples who have children. <laughs> so mm -hmm. let's acknowledge that as well. Exactly. I've seen a couple of hands, yes. Yep. So, yep. Um, and I've heard it explained too, like, uh, you know, if someone gets married younger, say 20 or 20, or not married, maybe you have kids or you don't, and then you have one in your. Are you going to go over that? We are. We are. Yeah. And at least half the people, or, oh, okay, I won't give a number, but many people I know are already on the second, and yeah. I've gone around there. Right. So yeah, we are definitely going to. That's one of the marriage models that we outline. I am a starter marriage person. That's right, yeah. <laughs> How many people in the room had a starter marriage, if you're comfortable raising your hand? A handful. Starter right? marriage is a, a marriage when you're young yeah, and, exactly. and, and short term. Yeah. A few years. And doesn't involve children. And doesn't I involve almost children. had one of those, yes, in the back. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if you're going to be offering a why or the fact that the data seems to show that successive marriage, the odds of it lasting become less and less. 
No, we're not really so much going to get into that. That's an interesting aspect, but that isn't part of what we're studying. Um, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. Do you, do you want to come? Well, in there's on that? just one thing that I would say about that is that um, there often are children involved. And it's more complicated, it, yeah. It adds layers, and some people don't transition to being step parent all that well. Um, so that has to, I would love to have teased out the numbers, how many second, because the rate is about 60% um, that doesn't make a second marriage, that's the, um, the divorce rate on a second marriage, but we don't really know how, what percentage of that has children involved. And right. children are game changers, you know, they really are. Yeah. And it goes up uh, for each subsequent marriage, the chances of divorce are higher, yeah. I wonder if you read that part about the same-sex marriage again with the children. Yes. I did, I Okay. <laughs> I don't have my phone. It makes me dizzy. Um, let's see. As of 2011, I'll give you the exact number, 6,005, 472 households were occupied by same-sex couples, and 168,092 of them were married. 16% of those same-sex families had a child, whether biologically, step, or adopted. No, you can have um, in vitro oh, yeah. yes. fertilization. Yeah. Guys can't. Right. <laughs> yeah, they can't. Well, no, yeah, right, yes. That's right. Well, that's, of course they can't have biological. They can't, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course they can. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep, yes. we are. Yes, yes. And in fact, thank you, Gail. And then there are the boomers, and they're skewing everything. Um, so about a third of adults age 46 to 64 were divorced, separated, or had never been married in 2010, compared with 13% in 1970. So again, big, big changes. Over the past 20 years, the divorce rate among baby boomers has surged by more than 50%, even as divorce rates overall have stabilized nationally. At the same time, more adults are remaining single. So just another stat on that. Um, uh, unmarried baby boomers are five times more likely to live in poverty than their married counterparts statistics show. They are also three times as likely to receive food stamps, public assistance, and disability payments. So, you know, we want to, Vicki and I want to highlight that one of the reasons that we support marriage as a structure is that it does help people stay out of poverty. It does, you know, there's statistics that people are generally happier, there's less mental health, less, uh, less mental health problems, um, less crime. I mean, so there are reasons that marriage can help people, um, but people are choosing, they, they'd rather get food stamps, as, as I show in the last line here. People are living longer, and many people, many couples in their 50s and 60s face with the prospect of a decade or more in unhappy marriages are reluctant to stay the course. So they're choosing to be on their own, yeah, instead of the financial security. I wonder about how many of the unmarried baby boomers who are in poverty are women. It's mostly women. Mostly women. Yeah, and I have a few more statistics too. Um, 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 staying married for the kids was the main reason that people said in an ARP study of a few years ago of why they stayed longer than they wanted to. 43% said they waited five years to divorce. But still, 76% of those between age 40 and 79 who divorced later in life had minor kids still at home. 43% of them were between the ages of 40 and 44, and that was the largest group. So. Um, this is kind of why we talk about a parenting marriage, mm -hmm. um, which we'll get into later, but there are a lot of children who are being impacted by um, parental divorce, and we're not against divorce at all. Mm -hmm. um, but we also f think 
part of the reason we wrote the book was for people to be more creative in their marriages and to individualize their marriages. And if there are ways to restructure them, to hold off on the divorce until the children are older, I think that benefits a lot of people. So, and Vicki was talking a minute ago about longevity being the, really the only measure that we currently have. And what's the one acceptable reason for people to marry? What is the one acceptable reason, or I should say the most acceptable reason that people get married? Because they love each other. Right, and so again, I love that. You don't leave without giving me your quote. Um, <laughs> that you know we're basing marriage on an emotion and an emotion that is fragile and changeable and um, what we're going to be talking about is getting into a little bit more purpose driven marriages not to say that love shouldn't be part of it i'm looking at some of the looks you're giving me um, hopefully it'll make more sense but um but just to to say again this has really been very recent in history that we have based marriage on love and it's clearly not working and we talk the, i love the the publisher if half of all cars bought in America each year broke down on the road, there would be a national uproar. But when half of all marriages, and we didn't use this word, in America fail, we blame the drivers, not the faulty engines. And that's the equivalent of what I think we do when we make people wrong for their marriage not working. Okay. So um, this is that slide that shows um, for second marriages or any remarriage actually, that 40% of newlyweds have already been, uh, to have somebody in the couple who's been married, one or both, yes? Oh yes, I just wanted to throw in the mix that, um, you know, along with perhaps love being difficult because primarily an emotion, I'm aware of literature and authors uh, back in the 60s commenting that love That's is right. primarily a decision. Uh -huh. I, I totally understand that, that it's, it's a, you know, that, believe me, we have talked to everybody, the whole range of people on the spectrum of, um, first of all, define love. Yeah, I was just right? going to say, like, can you define love and is that going to be the same right. answer that I give or Susan gives or other people give? Right. I mean, we all have a concept of what love is, but the way it is expressed and the way we want it to be expressed is very individual, quite honestly. That's why you probably see in your practice if you're dealing with couples, but I do this for her and I do that for her. He doesn't love me mm -hmm. because he's not doing what she expects him to do or vice versa. So we have lots of different <laughs> definitions of love. And, and I understand that point of it being a decision that this is you're committing to this. Um, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but there is the romantic ideal, and then there is the more mature, you know, sort of uh, love you, you do for the other, you take care of the other. Yeah, yeah and actually I want to add this. We did not... Uh, have any section or, or uh, on arranged marriages because we realize that's not that's a different right. way of reimagining marriage, it's a different way for coupling. But we did hear from a number of people who were in arranged marriages and what we heard from them was like, here's what love is. Love is when you see your spouse come home every day after work and caring for you and your children. That's how she defined love. That is not what American brides expect. They want the big, you know, passionate, big wedding, big everything kind of thing. Not everybody, but, you know, we're generalizing yeah. here. So we want the big passion love, not right. not the uh, someone showing it by, by doing. Right. Yeah, and that was just, I want to add to that a little, um, that we interviewed, uh, sorry, we surveyed uh, 978 people from throughout the world. We got responses from people in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, you know, Europe, New Zealand, everywhere. I mean, it was amazing. And, and that was a consistent thing that we heard from people who had arranged marriages was that they don't have the expectation that you love your spouse going into it. 
that is something that they expect, and I am being generalizing here, but you grow into it, and it is more on a, on a solid foundation based on actions versus um, an emotion. Yes? Uh, a statistic I heard from India uh, where arranged marriages are the norm and there's no stigma, particularly about divorce, is that the divorce rate is running about 1%. Did you get that? I didn't, we didn't do uh, statistics in every country, but I definitely believe that. And again, I think it gets back to what your expectations are of what this institution is supposed to do for you. Um, so 